Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for this masterclass. I see that people are connecting, so um, I'm gonna just wait a few seconds as everybody joins the webinar to introduce our masterclass and our panelists today. Uh, thank you so much for making time for us today. I know everybody's super busy on the other side and uh, making time to join this masterclass really means a lot to us. So, okay, people joining. It seems like we have around 200 people connecting right now. I'm gonna wait a few seconds. People keep coming in. And thank you to all our former students and prospective students that are with us as panelists today as well. Okay, people keep coming in. I'm gonna start introducing myself. My name is Camino de Paz. I'm the Assistant Dean of Governor World Programs at the Yale School of Management. And uh, part of my role is overseeing admissions for two degree programs, the Master of Advanced Management and the Master in uh, Global Business and Society. And I also um, oversee the back office of the Global Network for Advanced Management. Um, that is 32 schools around the world. And many of you are attending uh, one of those schools right now as we speak. We're here today on uh, a master class that is uh, based on one of our most popular electives at Yellow School of Management, that is also a small network online course. Um, and uh, the course is called uh, Economic Analysis of High Tech Industries. It's led by one of our professors, Professor Edward A. Snyder, William S. Beinecke, Professor of Economics and Management at Yellow School of Management, our former Dean, and also the founder of the Global Network for Advanced Management. He is going to be joined by uh, one of our former uh, alumni for, for the MBA for executives, Logan Bender. Logan Bender. Logan is a global technology investor and a research analyst uh, as well. And we have the support of Stacy O. Stacy is our special programs expert at the Yale School of Management. And we have, as I said before, former students with us have taken the course in the past. And we also have prospective students that are considering joining one of our degree programs. Um, those are the panelists. I'm gonna hand it over to Professor Snyder right now to kick off the session. And we're very, very grateful again for having you all today with us. Thank you. Thank you, Camino. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Yes, I'm Ted. I go by Ted Snyder. Some students from outside the, the, the US don't like first names. You can call me Professor if you would like, but it's great to have you all here. And this is, uh, uh, as Camino said, this is economic analysis of high-tech industries, of course, that Logan Bender and I developed, co-developed and teach in the fall semester. And it's been, it's been a great privilege for me to, to be part of this, this enterprise. So Logan, you wanna say hi? Good morning, good evening, everyone from around the world. Appreciate everybody joining us. Uh, my name is Logan Bender. I hail from Wisconsin. Uh, I'm a Yale SOM alum. I love the community and happy to be here and plugged in. Ted and I developed this course, as we said, uh, looking at real world events and, and tracking interesting things in the tech ecosystem all around. So we'll uh, we'll jump into that now. And Stacy, you're uh, you're in the command center, the virtual command center. You want to say hi? Hi, everyone. I've been working with uh, Ted and Logan since they developed the course, and um, it's been a pleasure to see how the course has grown and changed over the last few years and looking forward to the next iterations. So I, this, this class in some ways mimics how we set up the class. We have students zooming in from around the world uh, as part of the small network online course format, but we also have students face-to-face uh, -face in the classroom uh, at Evans Hall at Yale School of Management. And we draw students from all of our master's degree programs. And we also draw students from uh, around, around Yale. Uh, Camino, do you wanna say anything about who's joining today? Absolutely. So um, we have prospective students from all our degree programs. So the Master of Advanced Management, the Master in Global Business and Society, the MBA, full-time MBA, the MBA for executives, 
and uh, our uh, Master in Asset Management. And we also have current students from Global Network uh, schools from around the world that are interested in the topic and potentially considering taking the class in the future as a small network online course. So those are the ones on the other side watching uh, uh, the webinar today. Well, great, let's, let's get going, let's go. So uh, let's proceed with uh, our class today. And, and Stacy, maybe you could please introduce the matrix. So for those students who've taken the class, this, this is near and dear to, to their hearts and minds, I hope. So the course is organized around a matrix of three regions, China, EU, and US. And, and you see those in, as rows in the matrix and then four verticals, uh, mobility, video streaming, e-commerce, and payment systems. Uh, during the class, we'll probably be able to focus a bit more uh, deeply on mobility and video streaming, but but let me just ask, and I, you know, if you don't want to talk, you don't have to. But we've got this great group of panelists, so I'm going to call on people. Federico, why, what, what, what was your experience with with having a matrix, and did it help? Oh, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I'm really grateful to being here. Uh, but the question, yeah, yeah, I think it was uh, very uh, clear and very helpful to have a matrix. You know, uh, we we had the, the group project, so we had we knew where we had to focus. And personally, uh, I had uh, the video streaming in US. But having a matrix, I think that is introduced on the first class. If I'm not wrong, we introduced that the first class in September uh, was really something that helped me to have. Uh, the whole picture in mind all the time. So I think that it was something that it was really useful to me to understand all the different topics and connect all the different points we touched along the, the semester. Yeah, so, so Federico's bringing up a point that what we do is we organize team projects and the team is responsible for one cell in the matrix. And then uh, we of course have a major set of presentations towards the end of the class. Anna, what was your experience with, with the matrix? You know, and did, did you see value in it? Honestly, the value is extreme because like I'm not in the high tech industry and let's say I'm a little bit far away and I was really taking this course let's say, to dig deeper into this. And in our team, we were focusing on China, on e-commerce. That is definitely let's say, a huge market. You cannot even let's say, imagine the whole ecosystem that was created and it's actually let's say, overlapping with the rest of um, different the functions of different industries. So it was like great let's say, to have basically to have a look into this and to understand how the whole value chain is organized right now. So so thank you. Yeah, I think uh, having having a, a focus really helps. And then, uh, uh, you know, as you said, you you were focused on China and e-commerce. Well, what's different about China and e-commerce? Well, there's a lot different compared to, say, Europe. And one of the things that a matrix allows you to do is do what humans do. We compare and we contrast, and that's how we learn. So uh, the matrix is indeed central to the course. But Logan, maybe you could sort of cover how how is it that we approach and the actual analysis of these these high-tech industries across three regions sure so the course by design is an economics course that's the way it was built that's the foundational principles are all grounded in io industrial organization economics whether it's economies of scale whether it's looking at uh, contestability or other economic concepts that are fundamental to an analysis of any company but what's unique about this course is we bridge the uh, Western ecosystem, such as the US and European tech with Eastern technology ecosystems in Asia, China, and, and the, greater, uh, the greater Pacific region. 
Um, and what's unique also is we look at the market cap spectrum. We look at the giants, the BAT in China. We look at the FANG stocks in the US. But then we move down the market cap spectrum. We look at smaller companies. And then we go into the VC and the private equity ecosystem and you look at recent funding rounds and things like this. And so it's not just examining the giants and how they're getting more powerful. It's looking at disruptive companies. It's looking at emergent technologies. It's looking at how the funding landscape is changing, how the regulatory dynamic is, is changing. And within that it brings a central point that with these, all these ecosystems that are uh, interacting with each other, it's the rate of change that's fascinating and so captivating. And so we try to get the students as close to a real time view of that, whether we're tracking an IPO in real time, whether we're looking at a venture funding round, whether we're looking at what one of the tech giants is, is dealing with with regulation that invites guest speakers to speak on this and things like that. And so it's the dynamism of these industries that are so fascinating, so captivating. Uh, and that's is a striking element. And I think that makes the course unique. Uh, back to you, Ted. Yeah, so yeah, the, no apologies here. The, this is an economics class. So, so we try to understand economics uh, and, and apply it to what's going on in these industries. And there's some distinctive features about high-tech industries. Many of you probably have experience with them. Um, Logan mentioned economies of scale. I mean, when you have really low marginal costs, as is the case in, in high tech, um, that means that if you have a product or service that works, you can scale. Uh, and that's, that's a huge part. Um, there are also questions about, we'll get into this, about switching costs um, and uh, network effects. These, are, these end up being really important in a lot of industries, but in particular, very important about um, high tech industries. So, so let me, um, Logan, you touched on it. Uh, I, the way I think about it, this, there are forces hitting these ecosystems, a term that, that, that Anna used. And that, that generates a lot of change. Uh, let's talk about and see if we can come up with a list. I mean, what's been hitting these ecosystems? Um, and I'm, I guess I'm going to continue my, my effort to cold call on some people. Um, and if you're not, if you're not available to, to answer, that's fine. So, um, Aisha, what is hitting these ecosystems externally? Um, I, I think one thing I, I would love to lift off what Logan just mentioned in terms of the rate of change because of the interplay of each of these ecosystems themselves. And I think externally, because of the rate of change, the only way the world has really been able to sort of grapple with it is, is bringing in regulations, which are constantly being updated and sort of differ from economy to uh, country to country. And that's just sort of created this whole external net that plays over these ecosystems, but is so individualistic according to different regions across the globe that it just presents a challenge to analyze as a whole and as per each economy and as per each sector of tech that we're considering, but it's definitely a strong external force that will contend okay, with the high tech. So, thank you, Ayesha. So, so we have regulation and, and indeed, uh, you may be aware of this, you may not be aware of this, but the world has really changed in the last several decades. It used to be that the US and EU were sort of duopolis when it came to competition enforcement and antitrust enforcement. Well, there are 130 countries that have competition policy agencies. And one of the big changes is we're now in what I would probably refer to as the World Cup of competition policy and enforcement. And, and as Aisha said, it creates a lot of differences across the matrix. The EU is very different in part with its privacy laws from China and China has allowed the development of so-called super apps. And now, now in the last six months or so, they've tried to constrain the development of the super apps and the I would I would say the US is somewhere in between but that's one of the major forces what else uh, in the way of major forces anybody on the panel Anna Anna yeah yeah I definitely think that's a really good point I think the other thing that is in my opinion a really fundamental change that we haven't seen before which technology has enabled is the development of what we called in the class platform companies. 
which is basically instead of this being a company that sells you hardware or software or you know one sort of aspect of your life there are companies now which touch so many aspects of your life um, that it is difficult to get away from them. So you're looking at companies like Amazon, like Google, uh, like Meta, it's called now. Um, China, as you called them, they're called super apps. So you're talking about Tencent, Alibaba. And I do think that is also a fundamental change to these, you know, these industries overall, because you in some ways have to look across industries and for some companies, even cross country to be able to say, well, how are they positioned and where are they going? Because they don't just operate in one vertical anymore. They operate across, and for some companies, they're trying to operate across every vertical. Um, it is entirely possible right now, and I know many people do it uh, with Google, for example, to have all of your technology pretty much be Google-based uh, and from hardware to software to social. And that's that is something which I think the world not only has never seen before because we didn't have the technology, I also think the world doesn't really know how to handle that yet. So there are regulations that governments are trying to put in place, um, but it is my opinion that most governments right now really have not fully responded simply because this is such a new paradigm um, and this is, this is a shift which we have never seen before as a society. And if things like the metaverse continue to develop it's going to become even more extreme across the world, I think. Yeah, let's let's uh, ask a, a sort of a basic question. How, how, how can the metaverse actually happen? What's the technological uh, capability that's going to allow us to move from sort of very basic, you know, watching TV on cable to engaging in metaverse experiences? Pablo? Sure. Um, I think one important part is owning the hardware that makes it available for each one of us to do it from our homes or from our offices. Okay. Um, how about how about the, uh, the the communication infrastructure? What's the big development there? Yeah, five G is going to be a big one. Five G. Five G is huge, and it's not here yet, but it's. I mean, we see all the ads about 5G, but it's not here yet. Um, 5G is a big change. Uh, it, you know, if you sort of look at it, you know, like here's 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G is like that. It's just major game change. And with that, you get the so-called internet of things, major increase in connectivity between people and machines, machines to machines, speed, you know, downloads, so on and so forth. So that's a major external factor uh, hitting the network. Um, China and US, well, that's that by itself is pretty important because it used to be that, at least in my experience, I mean, I've traveled a lot to China, I've developed a lot of friendships and relationships there, but you know, it used to be that China and the US we're more friendly and now we're very competitive. And with that, you get geo blocking. When, when I go to China, there are certain apps I can't use. Um, there are restrictions under the last US administration to, to, to limit uh, some Chinese tech platforms and how they would operate here. So what, what was anticipated to be uh, a common plumbing, technological plumbing, if you will, that would support the development of industries and connect us, countries have figured out ways to divide us. And sometimes that's referred to as geo-blocking, sometimes it's referred to as splinter net. Um, so I think those are some of the things that are hitting the, 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 the matrix, hitting industries and limiting the ability of individual firms to become global. And that's one of the things that is really fascinating about the class, which we, we try to answer the question, which companies are actually able to become more global? Netflix, we'll, we'll get to that. Uber had, had some trouble. So, okay. So that's, that's a little bit about what's, uh, what's ha what, what the course is about in terms of the, the matrix and what's hitting the matrix. But let's turn to a current event. And for those students who are you know, joining from the past, you remember we start out every class pretty much with a, a current event. 
And I'd like to turn it over to Logan for, well, what's going on in the world? Thank you, Ted. <clears throat> and good points all on, on things that are hitting the matrix. I think one, uh, one that was missed, but we discussed extensively is the infusion of artificial intelligence and an apex technology such as that machine learning, deep neural nets, et cetera, that are perforating the ecosystem uh, in its entirety. <clears throat> and also just to build on Hannah's point, I think it was, it was well said that with what in live is the discussion makes it so rich in class is we're all power users of these technologies. We all have subscription services. We all go to foreign cities and sit in somebody else's car and stay in somebody else's house, you know, Airbnb, and that's totally normal for us now. And so these technologies, we all have a voice in, 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 in how these technologies are playing out. So I think that really is a big deal in our class to, to enrich the discussion. But let's look at a current event. In this case, it's an M&A deal. It's uh, Microsoft, uh, the, the, the old giant Microsoft is, is buying Activision. And so that's a $75 billion deal. Uh, it looks like it's probably going to go through. What this does, from my point of view, is it cements uh, Activision uh, into Microsoft. And so they're now a, a gaming leader. And they're now the third largest, I think, behind Tencent and maybe Sony uh, with this deal if it goes through. And if you look at what what type what what they're buying essentially is they're buying uh, a gaming base which is massive you know tens of millions of users that are deeply immersed uh, almost like a subscription service they buy games every year or they play games for years and years on end and so you have a long lifetime value of the customer you have uh, monetization levers such as streaming services and 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 esports and things like that and so i think that this is a, a, a brilliant acquisition by them i think microsoft now owns more than two dozen gaming studios uh, concomitant with this trend, we've seen uh, Sony and Takes Two do follow-ons, buying Zynga, buying Bungie, and so buying these gaming developers. And I think that introduces the question of uh, a metaverse strategy. And I think that with this acquisition, this is probably what the metaverse is going to look like. It's not going to be necessarily this virtual reality world, at least not yet. We're a long way from that, from a hardware development uh, and well, more so a software development perspective. But you can have a really immersive, interactive world without doing VR. And so uh, ATVI is one of the best studios in the world to develop these immersive games. And I think lastly, I'll say that this acquisition, I view this as a defensive acquisition too, because this disallows a Disney or a Netflix to potentially acquire ATVI, even if they could afford it. Uh, and so it protects them uh, and, and defends their essentially streaming as a subscription business, which kind of threatens a Netflix model, right? And we'll talk about Netflix and their churn problems a little bit later in the class. But uh, those are some of the things I see. And, and so, we, we, you know, stepping back, we see this pattern of vertical integration and maybe Ted will kick it back to you and we can discuss why. Maybe we'll pull the class and see what they say. So, uh, yeah, the, this, is, this is really an interesting pattern. Um, you had these, these companies, Microsoft, um, Sony, Take-Two Interactive, entering into contracts with game developers. So that was the old kind of way that these firms were organized. And now we see this pattern of vertical integration where instead of establishing contractual rights, they're establishing ownership rights through acquisition. Uh, CNBC, Squawk Box, earlier this week described this as the video game land grab. And it's happening. And it's, once it starts to happen, as Logan said, you, you get into this question of, well, you better start moving because the land is getting grabbed and th there's less and less. And it does establish this, this, this vertical integration pattern. And there are two types of vertical integration. One is backwards into supply of inputs. And then the other is forward into distribution. This is, this is the former. This is backward integration, moving from contracting with suppliers of games to owning them. And it's a pattern that we also see in, in, in other spaces as these uh, major platforms develop. They wanna get control of inputs. But th that raises the question, why bother? When you can write a contract, isn't that good enough? Can't you specify what's happening and, and uh, take advantage of the, the rights without having to manage? And he, this is a tough question uh, when we see this, this kind of change in pattern. Um, anybody wanna try to take a shot at why, why vertical integration replaces contracting? Anna, are you? Uh, 
Yeah, I think that there is, I think Logan made a really good point when he was basically saying that the challenge when you're looking forward to not only just video games, which are already on their own, a huge industry. So they're definitely worth going into on their own. But when you're looking longer term into sort of the metaverse and what Logan was saying that this is more of a software problem, I think one of the, the key points um, that I've read before is that the industry most likely to develop the technology to enable the metaverse is the video game industry, just by dint of what they work for and what they create both on the hardware and software side. So yes, you are right that I think you can definitely look at a contracting role and I think it'd be cheaper than 75 billion for sure. A lot of things are cheaper than 75 billion, but the problem becomes that if that technology truly does become breakthrough and truly does become the thing that enables not only the next generation of video games, which are already a huge industry, but also metaverse, um, there will be, I believe, several metaverses. And if yours is the best, that may not be a $75 billion opportunity, that could be a $500 billion opportunity. And the risk of just having a contract is there are ways to end contracts. And if that technology becomes that powerful and that valuable, then you know Activation Blizzard is going to start looking around and just saying, we don't have to just work with you anymore. It's not necessary for us to work only with Microsoft. And so I do agree with what Logan said that this is in many ways a defensive play because it could be, obviously, I don't know, you know, insider information, but it may be that Microsoft has a view that Activation Blizzard is far more advanced than other people may be aware of, or at least is the best positioned to make these advancements. And for that, a contract, frankly, just is not going to be, it's not going to be good enough and long-term enough. So, so Andre, do you buy into this, this explanation offered just now that, that, okay, metaverse is coming, supported by 5G. We've got a lot of potential metaverses coming into being. Games are gonna be one of the key medium, media mediums through which metaverse is created. And what Hannah is saying is the way I understand her argument, which I think is pretty, pretty solid, is that if that's the mechanism, if that's the medium, you want to have ownership rights as opposed to contractual rights. Andre, do you buy that? Yeah, I think uh, Hannah definitely raised a couple of great points. And just to build on those, I kind of see it in two spectrums. So I think the first would be uh, regarding the ownership point. I think originally when you know Netflix kind of came up with the streaming as a service model, I think it was more of a business model innovation and they could kind of differentiate themselves just based on having that distribution uh, layer. But I think as you know, platforms became more sophisticated, you got Disney Plus, uh, you know, a few other streaming offerings uh, coming into the market, it becomes more and more of a content play rather than a distribution play. I think that kind of uh, speaks to Anna's point about how like control of, you know, the content that Activision Blizzard brings, like uh, they have World of Warcraft, Call of Duty, um, Candy Crush as well. Uh, I think control of that content and gaming content becomes extremely important to Microsoft as they're looking to launch their Game Pass uh, you know, games as a service uh, platform as well. I think the second lens you can look at would be um, the whole metaverse angle. Uh, you know, I think Satya Nadella had an interesting interview where he speaks about his ambition for Microsoft to start the new uh, operating system for the metaverse, uh, kind of like what um, they did for the original PC. And I think to that point, it's extremely important to uh, for them to start learning by doing, which is another concept we spoke about when um, I was taking class under you. And I think in terms of learning by doing and understanding how to actually implement this operating system and how the metaverse works, it's important to have proprietary knowledge of um, and kind of like interact directly with uh, people with experience in the metaverse, like what Blizzard has, uh, compared to just having a contractual relationship where you're a bit further apart and you can't really um, integrate them as well with the offerings. So, yeah, yeah th we could probably continue and at, you know, spend a lot more time on this, but 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 let me try to sum up because we want to move on to some other topics. When you see a change like this, a pattern emerge, you have to ask what's going on? Why do we see this land grab? And rather than look at this as just an acquisition, it's valuable to say there's a major change happening. It's the emergence of metaverse. And with that, firms are gonna have to adjust and make changes. And if these assets are particularly important in terms of how they're deployed, how they're updated, and what is learned from them, 
very good point just now. It's better to have that ability to adjust and learn within the firm. And that's what we're see that's what we're seeing. So industries are changing, the scope of firms changing. Some firms are going to make mistakes. Logan's bet is this is a good acquisition. Logan, there's one thing that I just wanted to hit before we move on, which is I believe that the acquisition price, what, what uh, shareholders of Activision Blizzard will be paid is $95 or 92, I can't remember. The actual trading of Activision right now is around 80. What explains the gap between where that stock is being traded and what shareholders will get paid when the acquisition goes through? Yeah, that's gonna be a function of two things. There's a little bit of time value of money, but more so is regulatory scrutiny. Is this, and, and we look at the tech giants, everything from, you know, as you add to these tech platforms, they're getting more and more powerful, the, the regulatory pressure is ramping up. And we, we're gonna see this in the Activision deal, they're saying, are, you know, is Microsoft gonna to be too powerful by buying a gaming company? It sounds ridiculous, but it's actually, it's worth examination. Um, it looks like the market's pricing this to go through, I think chances north of 80%. And so I think that, that it will go through, but uh, that's the reason why you're seeing a discount, uh, discount to, to the strike that they've agreed upon. And I think, Another point, just answer this and we'll move on, is when we look at the private equity world, we see uh, fewer targets that are attractive to tech giants. So something you know, like a, like a Salesforce buying Twilio or something like that, that acquisition might make a lot of sense, but it's going to invite so much regulatory pressure that that asset can no longer be sold as easily as it might have in the past. And so that's something that we examine as a current uh, theme in the class. Back to you, Ted. Well, that's a great example, Logan, of how we, we we take something that's happening, we try to understand the economics, in this case, vertical integration, providing Microsoft with more control, more learning, and then take it all the way to valuation issues. And it's interesting, you, you, yeah, if you're, if you're an investor right now, 80% is pretty high, but it's not 100%. So how does that, you know, how does that 20% risk play out and which competition authorities around the world are responsible for that risk. So that's where the, the competition policy and enforcement and valuation really come together. All right, um, let's, let's, let's do some economics here. And uh, I wanna talk about two forces in high-tech industries that are very powerful. Um, one is switching costs, switching costs consumers switching from one service to another service, from one platform to another platform. And let's, let's get some uh, updates uh, on actual experience of people in the class. Um, hey Sung, I hope I'm pronouncing you right, from Seoul National. Can you- Yeah, uh, that's right. Can, can you reveal what video streaming services you, you subscribe to? or pay attention to and consume? Yeah, currently I'm sus subscribing to Netflix. You are, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. And uh, so you're a monthly subscriber. Correct. Anything else that you consume? Um, not yet, but I have been thinking about maybe switching to Disney Plus or other uh, local OTT services that we have in Korea. Okay. So, um, and if you were to switch, would you switch and leave Netflix or would you add? That's a hard question. <laughs> well, I well, you only have can... so many hours in the day. And right, the, right, and, that's right. Uh -huh. you know, what, we, what we've seen is with the relaxation of, of what I call the time and, and location constraints, um, people can watch any time of the day they can watch from wherever they want to watch. These are major changes compared to when I was a kid. Um, that the demand for video consumption has grown enormously. That said, it's still finite. You only have 24 hours in the day. So, so it, it's interesting. How about um, Pablo? Uh, could, and I don't know what you're going to say, but what is you know, what, what, what is uh, your experience with, with video streaming as a consumer? 
Um, I think in the last two years, I, 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 I mean, I subscribed to only one service that I, that was Netflix. Today, I subscribe. I'm subscribing to to Amazon Prime, to Netflix, to Disney Plus, and to Star Plus. So I think that's that's my situation right now. Anybody else on the panel want to talk about, you know, how much time they spend watching and whether they're switching and whether they're uh, um, contemplating switching? Anu. Um, yeah, so there's this interesting phenomenon that's happening, generally speaking, and I think a lot of people can probably relate to this, the fact that most of these subscription-based services are on a monthly level versus annual or a longer duration, and they're not that expensive, although when you sort of add up the different streaming services, it can kind of almost, it's kind of encroaching on the level of spend people, you know, would pay for cable. Um, it's very easy to switch in and out. And this concept of content is king, that's definitely happening. So people will subscribe to HBO Max because they wanna watch XYZ show, um, but then as soon as it's over, they'll cancel. Uh, so I think it's really important to look at churn um, when it comes to the subscription-based services at least. Super, so this is, this is exactly what we do in the class. We've established, you know, just from personal experience, switching costs are pretty low when it comes to video streaming and adding costs are low and much of the decision-making is driven by content and the monthly subscriptions allow switching and imagine it, okay, if you're, if you're Netflix, you'd like to have everybody on an annual contract, but you also wanna attract new subscribers and they'll be, they'll be fearful of entering into a, an annual contract. So you offer monthly contracts with no penalties for for getting out of them. And that's, where else do we see low switching costs? We see it in say ride sharing. Uh, that's that's a, one of the industries within mobility, quite easy to, to, to switch. Um, so that's a, that's a powerful economic concept that encourages and fosters competition in high-tech industries. Let's, let's shift to another concept which is network effects. And I wanted to um, ask Anthony, one of our prospective students, thanks for joining. Um, you're, you're in Hong Kong, right? Yeah. And uh, one of my favorite network schools, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Um, so, uh, I'm guessing this, but but do you partake? Do do you consume any of the services offered by Tencent? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, maybe uh, every Chinese, maybe every every Chinese, they are the heavy user of the, the WeChat because we we need we need to use WeChat to communicate with our our friends, our families, and our uh, some sometimes with our professors. <laughs> So, so you mentioned WeChat. Could you know for those yeah. of us, not everybody under, knows what WeChat is. Could could you explain what WeChat is? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a uh, instant messaging app, uh, just like the uh, WhatsApp and the Messenger. You can use the WeChat to uh, send some messages with uh, to your friends, to your family members, and there's no cost. And also, uh, the WeChat has already has already integrated many functions in China, just like you can use WeChat to pay for the bill. To, fee, to pay for the utilities. And also you can watch some, uh, some videos just like TikTok. And also you can post some, uh, some pictures and some stories in your WeChat, just like the Instagram. So WeChat is just kind of in, uh, integrated apps in China, combined the functions from Instagram, from messengers, from Facebook, from, uh, from most of the popular apps in the United States. <laughs> so, so all of your family and friends and colleagues are on WeChat uh maybe 90 percent <laughs> okay. so, so that, very high coverage so so that's a that's an example of network effects right and yeah. and the fact that you can connect to 90 percent of the people at no cost through wechat is is wonderful and then if somebody you know claims that uh he or she um uh you know, is in debt to you or something, or you're in debt to them, you, you can pay them. 
And then you can okay. contact somebody and say, hey, do you want to play a game? Is that right? Is that, you know, right. And also I can, I, I can click a like when some, some, someone win a competition or post some, uh, some award in his, in his uh, we call it a moment, just like an Instagram like service. So that's one of the things that we see in China that is, is it's not completely different, but it's, it's so powerful in China. You've got the yes. super app, you get the network effects, you build the user base, and it's, and you know, the, there's so many people outside of mainland who are using WeChat, using Tencent. It's a phenomenon in the US, it's a phenomenon globally. There's so many uh, Chinese ethnic uh, users around the world. But then what Tencent has been able to do is add in other applications that complement WeChat. And you can do yes. payments, you can watch video, et cetera, et cetera. So that's that's where you you see an example of network effects contributing to the development of a user base. And one of the terms that sometimes gets used when we're characterizing user bases is stickiness. Is the user yes. base sticky? Can you imagine, Anthony, not being on not being part of that user base. <laughs> no, I cannot imagine because uh, because I use iPhone. Uh, there's a there, there's statistics about the user time. When I when I check the user, the screen user time, I, I, I realize that maybe the top one or the top two they will chat. <laughs> I, I think that, that that is why we we want to because because there is a network effect. We want to stick to we want to be sticky to the apps. We want to communicate with our friends by using this this app. Terrific. You know, I, I figured that you would answer this way, but I didn't know. Uh, but, it, you know, it's great to draw on the experience of people in the class. And thank you for sharing that. So question to uh, Christian, uh, uh, you've got your hand raised, but I'm going to ask you a specific question. Maybe you'll answer it, maybe not. Um, we've just covered switching costs, low in some contexts. We've just covered network effects, powerful in some contexts. That raises the question, doesn't it? Is it easy for a tech company or not to retain its user base? Uh, well, you're speaking my mind. Actually, I wanted to comment on exactly that. I mean, very recently, we were reminded of how difficult it actually can be to keep daily active users. I mean, Facebook is really a good example of that. They really you know, they, they missed guidance. You saw the stock price plummet yesterday. Um, and so, I mean, that is really, there's a good reason for that. I mean, for the first time in history, they have less daily active users. And so you really have a reversal in trend and, and also very, very worried. I mean, rightfully so, I, I think so, because we've seen, you know, kind of this unfolding of network effects, the more people are on the platform, you know, the, the, the more friends want to join because they know their friends are there, right? And now, um, and then of course, also more advertisers wanted to come. So that kind of created a flywheel of revenues coming in. And now, you know, we might be witnessing, um, say a reversal of network effects, say kind of to the downside. And maybe just as much as it rose the user count, it can, you know, reduce at the same pace. And that's really something I'm gonna be looking out for in the next couple of months. And just a final point on that, I mean, I think that um, uh, TikTok is stealing the show, right? So um, yeah, I mean, that's how, how quick it can go. So is Facebook so yesterday? <laughs> Anna, you want to comment? Yeah, basically I wanted to compliment what Christian was just mentioning because it was the announcement that Netflix actually to their shares that they decreased by 20% or something like that as well mainly because they didn't manage to attract the number of customers that they were forecasting. And I think that they were having like very high aspirations regarding the COVID, that there is still a lot of people will be like sticking in and continuing just like watching nonstop all the episodes. But it looks like it's, it's, not, it's not the case eventually that uh, at the end of the day, that number two of subscriptions, it can decrease as well, or at least it didn't, do not reach this benchmark that they were really targeting on. Yeah, I think, you know, this TikTok phenomenon really caught a lot of people by surprise. You think of, you know, user base is like a glacier. 
you know, and you can build on it the way Tencent has, and then boom, you got migration to something called TikTok. And it's happened so fast with a differentiated product that the user base, a segment of the user base found attractive. And it is, if you're, if you're a high tech company, the user base is your most important asset, probably second most important is the information about your user base. And to have this first time ever decline for Facebook, very scary if you're Facebook meta. Um, other comments about whether it's easy or hard to, to keep your user base. Um, Andre, do you have anything on this? Justin, I see you, you just raise your hand. Yeah, I wanted to comment on uh, how this ties into uh, kind of the switching costs and how firms respond by potentially uh, altering their products. And the example I wanted to bring to complement is Snapchat, which yesterday uh, during the day uh, had a sell off likely due to the uh, meta news. Um, and I think a lot of investors assume that uh, they would also see a negative trend in their uh, active users. And however, you know, it's up like 40% on the day uh, because for the first time they reported a quarterly profit, but also because they are responding a little bit uh, by monetizing other aspects like their spotlights and maps feature. Um, and just wanted to comment on if we think about which consumers these firms are fighting for, that there's always a group that uh, maybe hasn't been discovered yet, uh, which the metaverse will bring clarity to that, uh, or is just a, a lot of uncertainty about which firms are going to win in that space. And that uh, while it's true that big firms can continue to retain their existing consumers, there's always consumers that uh, new firms can be fighting for. Um, and so, like, for example, like tying to the Microsoft discussion, that might be why is they want to get a hold of those users as soon as possible. Um, and uh, the, potentially the lowest cost, fastest way to do that is to acquire an existing player that has a lot of the existing um, consumers. Super, super comment. So that's what that's let's let's uh, sum up here. We've got switching costs that can be low, can be high. We've got network effects low or high competition for users and information. And there's tremendous diversity across the matrix. And the, but the dynamics are always there, pressure uh, to retain and, but also for rivals to take away the user base through new products, new uh, innovations like short video, like meta, et cetera. So, with that, let's let's go back to sort of one of the major columns in, in the matrix. And Logan, maybe you could sort of give us your assessment of what is happening in video streaming. This is an industry that Alex, you would remember that we flagged when the course started and we said, boy, this is an interesting one. You know, will will uh, will we see the development of something like Netflix? Will they have rivals? Will they really be able to exert them, you know, sort of market power and become super valuable? Or will they always have these, these other services encouraging people? Some of you are, you know, already admitted to this that, you know, you're, you know, interested in, or at least willing to, to switch away from Netflix. But Logan, let me, let me turn to you. What's going on in video streaming these days? Well, a couple of reactions to the conversation, I think that tie into this. Uh, one, when you talk about the Facebook drop, we see a decrease in monetization. That decrease, as small as it may have been, wiped off you know, a quarter of a trillion dollars in market cap overnight. So that shows the sensitivity of the investor base to, some, to a force like that. Also, in, in parallel with Netflix, their, their drop, the stock dropped precipitously on their slower user growth. And so what we're seeing in video streaming, just in general, we've seen consumption patterns shift from long form down to short form. You know, iconic example is going to the movie theater and now it's TikTok on your phone that you open up 40 or 50 times a day, sometimes 100 times a day looking at the demographics. 
And so we see this relationship of moving more to short form, smaller, uh, smaller bits of content. Uh, that's where the industry has gone. In the case of Netflix, we've seen uh, slowdown in user growth, which is uh, obviously going to excite the management and excite the investor base. I think there's going to be continued pressure. And we've seen this kind of pendulous, almost seasonality between users migrating towards one show, one hit show, and then they go out and then they go back in, they go back out. Uh, Ichi is a great example of this in China. I remember I met them during their IPO, and this was a major point. Uh, and we actually didn't invest in them at the time because of that, of the very nature of the user base. It seems to be ephemeral. It's there one day, it's not there the other day. And so it's almost month to month. And when you have these subscriptions that aren't annualized as Anna made the point earlier, they're monthly. And so you have necessarily, you have basically zero customer loyalty, you have zero visibility and revenue. At the same time with these streaming business models, you have to spend literally billions of dollars with new content and then buying up old content. So you have to have this massive selection, this huge content library. You're on this huge cash burn trajectory all the time. And so that's what the streamers are facing is they're facing this wheel of cash burn all the time in order to generate new content, to keep that user base that's not as sticky as one may think it is. And so I think um, maybe we should ask a couple of the students. I had Alex uh, on my list. Alex, maybe you want to weigh in and, and expound on this. And, maybe, and also looking at Netflix, I think maybe you remember in the class, we saw a tremendous international subscriber growth with Netflix. That's part of what drove the narrative, drove the story of it. Do you think that the geographic expansion provides a defensible advantage or geographic scope? And maybe just give us your thoughts. Yeah, thanks, Logan. I, I, uh, that's a good point. I, I wasn't thinking about that off the top of my head, but uh, I think what's interesting about all of these technology companies from the, if you, if you look at the long story arc of their evolution, is they're, they're coming up with uh, some new form of convenience in order to generate cash flow first. So you have Netflix early on, you know, a decade or so ago uh, with direct-to-consumer DVD service, uh, mail and DVDs, uh, you, you generate a pile of cash and then you pivot uh, into something new. And so now, uh, you know, for their own survivability, I think what they're looking at is, is amassing this market power through uh, content acquisition uh, and, and, and siphoning off uh, or partitioning uh, who owns the rights um, excuse me, to certain intellectual property or certain content. And so you have, uh, you know, as Ted was talking about before, in terms of splinternet and internet of things from a geographical standpoint, uh, in the business landscape, you have, um, you know, Netflix or Disney Plus uh, segregating off, you know, what, what content people want, uh, and then therefore tying you to that platform uh, and forcing you to, to purchase uh, through them. And that's their only way of, of, generating or, or maintaining that sort of market power. I think that that's been what's most interesting to me. I'm, I'm not a big uh, uh, movie or TV watcher. So, uh, you know, my switching costs are low, but there was an article uh, about a week or two ago uh, that talked about how people are signing up for these streaming services, watching the one show that they want to watch and then uh, dumping them. So, you, you know, to a news point, you do have a lot of churn in the, in the customer base. Uh, so I think that the real value behind these companies is in what content they own at any given time, given its its temporal popularity, uh, and then pivoting into something else. Actually, well said, I, Alex. I, Anu, do you want to weigh in? Actually, could I interrupt? I, I please. I think I saw the same article that Alex is referring to. Um, Stacy, could could we share that? Yes. And a, as you're sharing it, uh, sometimes my job is to try to unpack a little bit of what Logan said. He referred to this pendulous. Is that the term you use, Logan? Yes, that's right. Yeah, it's, it's exactly right. What he's talking about is, uh, and I think it was Anna mentioned it too, that you got this content driving people and it's like a old fashioned clock with a pendulum. And the content is at the bottom of the pendulum and it's moving. And when it moves, when somebody gets a hit show, it pulls the, the user base over to that, that part of the arc, to that platform. Um, and this was, I think, Alex, is this the article that you were referring to? Yes. Yeah, it's just what Logan was talking about. You know, what we're, you know, you sort of think that Netflix would have an advantage because with all these high tech firms, the marginal cost of showing a show to somebody else is zero. Um, and so tremendous economies of scale and geographic scope and reach and Netflix has that. But the thing that ends up being really difficult is this struggle to keep content. And 
it turns out that Netflix may have some advantages, but there are many rivals who are able to develop compelling content with the result that some subscribers are just moving from platform to platform following the content. And that's, that's what's being revealed by this um, recent data on actual consumer usage. Back to you, Logan. Yeah, Anu, I think you had a comment and then maybe we'll move on. Yeah, I just wanted to um, to offer that, you, you know, we're not just uh, dealing with the subscription based services, it's important to also consider the free ad supported services as well. Um, like every major TV OEM, for instance, has their own streaming service. So you turn on the TV and one of the options on the first screen is to watch like, let's say Samsung TV plus, which is what I work for. Um, and so the amount of hours, we talked about time in a day, the amount of hours that people are spending consuming content, it's not just now, it's being diverted from subscriptions to also free, um, which is also inclusive too of you know user generated content, uh, like we talked about short form. So it's important to consider all of those things in terms of competing for attention span and, and mind share, if you will. A great point. Yeah, that's a great point. And if we look at the obverse of that on Facebook, they have the monetization through ads, but they have no subscription. I mean, and, and you look at the sensitivity of the users to any subscription that they'd have to pay on a social platform. Facebook has over 2 billion DAU, 2 billion daily active users, and they never have charged a subscription at all ever in the history of their company. So that shows you the tremendous sensitivity around uh, that type of behavior. Back to you, Ted. Well, we are unsurprisingly, we could spend more time on what's happening with, with video streaming, but for, for, for people who really are working in the industry, you think about the total size of the market and, and then how are the valuations for firms operating within that market? It's a really hard problem. Massive sw swings in, in market cap as we're seeing. And now we're saying, well, wait a minute, all this video streaming stuff Maybe a lot of people are going to shift from video to, to games and meta. So massive, massive uh, change possibly underway with big implications. Um, let's let's Logan. Let me ask you about electronic vehicles because now you know this past semester um, we spent a lot of time on EVs, and it was it was just one of the most interesting parts of last semester. It's obviously an industry within our mobility vertical. And um, Logan, what's your take on what's happening? My take is we've seen uh, essentially an explosion in valuation. We looked at the Rivian, we kind of tracked the Rivian IPO throughout the course, and it, there's a lot of great discussion on it. But Rivian is a firm that they IPO'd north of 100 billion. I think their first day they went up to 100 billion or 110 billion in cap. Uh, and they forecasted less than $1 million of revenue for the next three months, and their operating loss is absolutely massive. And so you have this intensely capital intensive technology, you have research and development cycles that are lengthened, you're competing with the Teslas of the world, you have no revenue, you have a massive capital structure, and you're essentially, you're making no money, but you're valued at north of $100 billion. And so we ask ourselves, logically, does this make sense? And I think uh, one of the themes in the class that, that we touch on a lot in all these verticals, but particularly in EVs, it's been really pronounced in EVs this, this, this last few months, is the narrative. The narrative is driven, the story has really captivated a lot of investors, whether they're institutional or retail or otherwise, and narratives are able to drive these economic events to these stratospheric valuations, these stratospheric proportions. And Stacey, I think maybe you have a comp table slide we had in the class, maybe pull that up. We could look at that for just a second. That might illustrate, we look at uh, different competitors. Let's see if Stacey can, can pull it up for us. So here we have a couple things. We have uh, our market cap and our revenues. And so we just took a couple, a couple competitors, and this is just a very basic slide. We look at the market cap of four electric vehicle makers uh, compared to GM, which obviously is an aging OEM giant, but they're trying to catch up. They're really trying to develop uh, and be competitive with EVs. We look at the market cap, slide on the left, look at the market cap of Tesla relative to all these other automotive makers. And then this, the uh, chart on the right, we see the revenues. So you look at the revenues, the trailing 12 months, TTM revenues <clears throat> of Tesla, Rivian, Neo, um, and Lucid relative to GM. So if you look at the revenue base versus the market cap, there seems to be a dislocation. So I'll toss it back to you, Ted. Maybe we'll get some thoughts from the students on uh, what's been happening in this uh, space. 
Yeah, I, I just wanted to just comment. I mean, if, if you didn't know the left-hand side and you just presented the right-hand side, I mean, what would you expect? You wouldn't expect the left. No. GM revenues are, you know, still- 130 massive. billion, yeah. Yeah, so how, okay. I'm gonna turn it back to you. I mean, how in the world can this be right? People are betting on this, right? This is real money. Absolutely. I think this is, uh, they, they've, they've established the idea that Tesla is a company of the future. And essentially it's crystallized the view that, that investors feel comfortable with this being the future and that dominance. And so let's turn it over, Hannah, Alex, uh, one, of, one of you two, go ahead. Let's hear your thoughts. I had uh, two, two kind of open-ended questions about this, uh, this topic in particular. And one was, how much is Rivian, uh, their ability to raise cash tied to Tesla stock uh, and tied to the appetite that the market has for Tesla um, being folded into, I believe the, the uh, forgive me, Fortune, Fortune 100 recently or S&P 500, I can't remember which one, but they were recently indexed, I think. Uh, and the second question is, uh, what's, the, what's the macro risk um, with this industry um, being tied to some of the precious metals and minerals and, and lithium uh, deposits around the world, uh, as well as uh, rising interest rates and the ability to pile cash into developing uh, some of these supply chains? And, yeah. and what, is, what is the macro risk on these companies that are further along uh, downstream? Sure. So really quickly. So your second question first. So you're looking at a play like Cobalt out of China, for example, that's going to be a uh, sense of interest rates. It's obviously, it's obviously very constrained. So that's a very constrained natural resource. And that's going to play into the EV conversation. That doesn't seem to impact the valuation. That's another thing that's really interesting about this space is that you have these different macroeconomic potential shocks or shocks in the future that could happen that don't seem to affect the appetite for the risk of these businesses. That's one. Um, and then to your first question about raising capital, it's never been a better time. Alex, if you want to go out and start an EV maker, you could probably raise 100 million bucks in six weeks. I mean, I, I, I jest, but, but you get my point that you've seen these massive capital raises for this space. But we also look at, and in the class, we don't have time to unpack it now, but the software element, the autonomous driving element, what's going to happen with the semiconductor story? What's that narrative? What's happening there? Who's going to own that? Is VW going to own the driving software? Is Tesla going to own the driving software? What if a Toyota crashes and it has BMW software in it? So you have these different regulatory pressures. You have the European Union weighing in. You have different you know, geofencing concerns in the US, et cetera. And so you have all these different themes that come in and kind of and, and diverge in this nexus of this EV uh, revolution that's happening now, not to mentioned batteries. Uh, so there's a lot of different themes there uh, to unpack and nobody knows what the future is going to hold, but it's absolutely fascinating. Hannah, do you have a comment? Yeah, I mean, and I don't pretend to be an EV, you know, expert, but I definitely think of what you were saying about the story is hugely important for this scenario with uh, what we're seeing in terms of valuations. You know, Tesla has obviously done a really good job. I mean, you can't really argue with the success that they've seen. Having said that, you sort of go back to both Tesla as well as uh, Rivian in terms of what they're being valued. I mean, does it warrant a nearly $1 trillion market cap? I mean, you're betting very heavily on the future and you're almost pulling the value of any profits they may be able to make into today. Um, so it really asks the question, of, even if they achieve that, which honestly, it does look like they can, you're paying a lot for that today and it doesn't leave a lot of runway for the future. And I think with Rivian, there's also the added concern that, in my personal opinion, is not being accounted for enough is that they don't make their own batteries. And that is a really key element that Tesla has, which I think is really, really powerful. I mean, someone once said to me that Tesla is a battery company that happens to put their batteries in cars. Um, and that really where they have focus and why they have been so successful is, is the batteries whereas Rivian doesn't doesn't have that. Um, so that's a risk I think that maybe is like you're saying, they're, they're so dependent on, or what Alex was saying, they're so dependent on the success story of Tesla and being able to say we're the next Tesla. And frankly, probably having a lot of investors, including companies like Ford, which are saying, oh, we miss Tesla. We can't miss the next one. Um, how much is that driving it? I would say it's a, I'd say it's a pretty good chunk. Um, but then there's a lot of risks, which, you know, not only Rivian, but also Tesla are exposed to. What if a new technology comes out um, that makes lithium batteries obsolete? I mean, that's a huge risk that they also face. So I think, you know, what you're saying is right. There's a huge number of risks in this industry. Um, 
And the, the bullish sentiment is partially driven by belief, but I think it's also driven by, uh, you know, like you're saying, it's very easy to raise capital. There's a lot of money sloshing around right, right now. And I think that's also helping. So if I could chime in here. So Sackett, maybe I could ask you to say, say you're a senior person in Tesla justifying this. And you're 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 going to take advantage of these capital markets, and uh, you got a lot of momentum, and and you know I'll refer to this. You know I'm an economist, so I'm going to draw a graph on the on the board here. But uh, how how could you sort of develop a positive narrative for Tesla? Um, so I, what I've got drawn here, I hope. Yeah, you know, tell me if you can see it, Socket. Can you? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, so we have our standard price here on the vertical axis, quantity on the horizontal axis, and that generates these revenues. These aren't these aren't huge. We saw that these are pretty small relative to GM, but they're revenues. But what makes what makes this revenue box project into the future to a one trillion dollar market cap? Can you talk that through? It's 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 right now it's okay, but it's this has got to change, right? So yeah. how, how how would you use economics to explain what's going on? Um, I think economically, I'm not pretty sure how how one can justify the huge valuation compared to the revenues of Tesla that we see today. Well, um, but the, one sorry. thing though, with Tesla, would you say that the marginal cost of Tesla vehicles is lower than GM? Uh, yeah, mm, yes, more, yeah. Uh, very certainly, yeah. the marginal cost. So that's one thing, compared to GM, if we were to imagine this and we, we try, to, yeah. try to do this for GM, this marginal cost line would be a lot higher and the margins yeah. GM would be a lot lower. Yeah. So that's one thing that Tesla's got in its favor. Yeah. The other, th the other thing, what about, you know, I can't remember, Logan, do you remember how many vehicles Tesla sold last year? Last year, uh, several hundred thousand, I think. So what's going to happen to the quantity going forward, Sackett? Um, I think you, you're going to see an exponential growth in the quantity going forward. Yeah, we're going to see a shift. So, so we have this area of, of profit, and we're going to get a big shift here. And the way Logan talks about it is, what's the total available market? And there's a lot of room for growth in EVs globally. Mm -hmm. The other way that this all-important area of, of revenue above cost can grow is price can go up. I don't know, I don't know what you think about it. Um, but those to me seem to connect the economics to the valuation issues. And you have to come up with a pretty strong story about growth and margins to, to justify Tesla. And I thought the points made earlier about macro risk technology risk with batteries. I would add in infrastructure risk. Who's going to own the infrastructure? Mm -hmm. Tesla's got to, you know, potentially pay a lot of money. Any any EV manufacturer's got to play with business and society. So, you know, Saka, what, what you know, would you be a buyer? So uh, I think economically, I, I think we can only reach to a certain justification of the valuation. The remaining part, I think, is kind of associated with all the risks that people mentioned. And I think there's a huge amount of uncertainty about how the electric vehicle market will unfold in the future. What Tesla has been able to do along with the personality cult of Elon Musk is, uh, you know, is being, is being able to instill confidence in people that no matter how the EV market is going to pan out, Tesla is going to be a market leader. And that uh, in some sense has been uh, able to justify their huge valuation. Yeah, these businesses uh, embody real options to develop other businesses. And what we know about Tesla and Elon Musk is they're very attentive to new opportunities.
Camino, how much time do we have left? Uh, we have around 20 minutes. Okay, we're, so, we're, so we're actually doing pretty well. Um, Rivian, Tesla. One thing that I would say about Tesla going back to the matrix is um, Tesla has a plant, am I right, Christian? They have a plant in, in Germany, right? They do, just south of Berlin. They're right in the heart of one of the major auto industries in the world. That, that had to be a bit of a surprise to have Tesla plant a, a, a flag there. Well, I mean, just to comment on that, I think the answer would be twofold, right? Like for, let's say, employment opportunities, I think it's great that they build the plant just south of Berlin because it's in a, you know, structurally rather weak environment. So it's great for Germany, right? You know, usually you have the, the car industry in the south. There, that's rather in the north. So that's great. I mean, of course, on the other hand, I mean, uh, BMW, um, Mercedes or formerly Daimler, uh, you know, they're not exactly going to be thrilled about that, um, especially because, I mean, it, it, you know, Elon Musk knows very well that there is a, you know, very much intact, um, uh, say, a web of, of suppliers down there uh, where he can attach himself to. And, I mean, he, he's going to start producing some half a million cars there next year or the, the following year. So, mm -hmm. so that shift... Uh, in terms of output in Germany, a big driver. Oz, um, do you, I mean, I don't know if you have comments, but I, I wanted you to weigh in and, you know, we spent a lot of time. I think Tesla also established a plant in, in China. So they're in all, all three regions. Um, do you have comments on, on Tesla yeah. and EVs? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, not to forget, Tesla is actually not just a car company. Right. I mean, if you, if you think about it, they do energy, they do uh, generation, they do distribution or they start to do distribution, especially in Germany. So, uh, I mean, they have this multiplier effect just starting with batteries, but they can do way more than that. And I think this ties in well with the storyline that you just mentioned. And I was just taking some notes, but if I may come back on that, I mean, one point is Elon Musk. I think he's one of the just the name is one of the biggest drivers for 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 let's say the numbers, that's what I personally feel like. The second one is that it's not just a, a car company. I mean, uh, like I said, they do solar panels, they do like uh, ge energy generation, distribution, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I mean, they're one of the first, to my opinion, one of the first cars that have actually software on wheels, right? If you, if you have listened to Volkswagen CEO, uh, they just created a software company um, called Cariad. And in one of the discussions, he was saying, well, we have to become like Tesla. Yeah. And that's just another factor of, of, of showing that, well, Tesla is up there and it's just, it's not just a car. There's so many factors around it that make this company great. And that's why I believe the numbers are so high at the end of the day on the financial market. James, you're, uh, you're, you've decided to apply to Yale SOM and you're, uh, um, I think you, You've been a student or you are a student at INSEAD? Is that correct? No, I, I was a student. You were? Okay. Yeah. And, and what's, your, what's your reaction to uh, the, the Tesla story? Is a glo I mean, you know, INSEAD is, you know, has a global perspective. And, uh, I think yeah. a couple of things. I, I think first, the, in the capital market, I think uh, as Oris men, uh, mentioned before, I do think the investors thought in story that not necessarily a automaker, but more of a technology company, which has been all the way from a smart to a way of driving to software and, and energy science. And secondly, I think the company itself does actually have a really good hold of the major auto market, for example, obviously very well established in the US, but in China last year, I think it's so almost half a million uh, half a million cars, and especially af after it established its factory in Shanghai, and almost half of its half of the Tesla. So every year was to China, so it captured the major market now, and in, in, in doing it in building a factory in Germany. 
I think I, I do think it's somewhat like the capital market has so much confidence in that some of the latest. Yeah, that's one of the insights that people get from the speakers that we have in the class is, you know, and I, you know, I've learned so much about capital markets and it, I, I applaud the, the people on the call who brought this up, uh, who's, who's willing to, to invest in whom. And it's not, it's, it's, it's a really important issue. Um, by the way, James, which program are you thinking about? Oh, uh, MAM. Oh, good. All right, great. Um, I can honestly say it's, that's a, that's a program that's near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, it was totally innovative and I think it's now nine years old. Is that right, Camino? Yeah, first class was 2013. So, yeah. So, so, um, I don't know if we have any questions from, from the webinar participants. Could we just, could I just wrap up one comment, Ed, before jumping to Q&A, if you mind? Not at all. Uh, yeah, so looking at the software discussion, which is a, a fascinating uh, uh, element to, to the narrative of Tesla and EVs in general, if we look at what, what could be the competitive response then of the other OEMs, if Tesla is so advanced, one of the, one of the key pillars of the Tesla thesis is that they build the machine that builds the machines, that they are better at designing at scale and building at scale than other OEMs are, and therefore they own that piece of the future. And so they, they occupy intellectually in your mind as an investor, they occupy that space. Uh, but if we look at what what could the other OEMs do? Well, one business model that that has kind of made some noise in the past, such as a GM, why are they buying server farms? Why are they investing in autonomous technology? Because in their view, they might be able to roll out an autonomous vehicle for you know forty thousand dollars that drives for one hundred fifty thousand miles, completely autonomous, and they go back and they scrap it instead of selling it to one consumer for a forty thousand or you know fifty thousand dollar price tag one time every ten years. Now they essentially have a subscription business, and so that is one way that they can compete. Or uh, you know a, a European manufacturer OEM, they could say, well, we don't want Tesla software in Germany. We want BMW software in Germany. Or you know the, the Italians could say something about what they want in Italy from their OEMs, for example. And so. There's these different dimensions of competition that we're seeing emerge in the space around the, the technology part of the stack, not just these things on wheels, these pieces of hardware. Uh, and then obviously, you know, Oz mentioned key man risk. You know, if, if Elon Musk was run over tomorrow by a Tesla, that would be a big deal because he's a visionary founder. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, elements, but I think investigating potential competitive response uh, intellectually is interesting. So back to you, Ted, maybe we'll jump into Q&A. Yeah, yeah, great point. Um... I've grown fond of Elon. I, I was a little suspicious when he was taking so much money from the government, but you know, compelling figure, I would say, in the global landscape. Camino, do we have some questions from the webinar? We do have questions. Um, uh, and well, before let's take we a couple at least. Yeah, before we jump into those, I just want to let everybody know that the recording will be shared with registered participants. That was one of the questions if they were going to get the recording. Okay, so there's a, a, a question for uh, everybody. Meta just lost $30 billion worth of market capitalization in a single day as the company released their financial data. What is your opinion on that? Logan. Uh, yeah, well, 30 billion turned into 250 billion uh, after hours. And again, it, it relates back to uh, they, they monetize at a lower rate. And so if they can't monetize their ad revenue, what then do they do? Is Facebook essentially just an advertisement company? Are these DAU and MAU numbers, the daily active users, monthly active users, is that valuable? Is that metric as valuable as it once was? And there, if you cannot monetize them, uh, oddly, on the earnings call, Mark Zuckerberg mentioned supply chain issues, which I have a hard time with that, uh, mentioning supply chain issues if you're an advertisement company like Facebook. So I think that was a bit of a reach. But uh, what we've seen in Facebook as a trend is we've seen a decline in engagement and therefore decline in monetization. And so I think it's a very big deal for investors. And you saw the knee-jerk toxic reaction to that. And I think it's up to them to win back the confidence. And looking just at the meta segment of what they're trying to do with the metaverse, that operating loss, I think was north of $8 billion, almost $10 billion. Uh, and they haven't really generated much revenue for it. And so even though that's a long-term competition you, or long-term view on what's gonna happen uh, with our digital universe, you see a lot of competition coming in, i.e. Microsoft, Activision, you see other participants in there, Apple's gonna be there 100%. And so Google's gonna be on that uh, on that too. So that's it's gonna be interesting to see that dynamic unfold. But if I were a Facebook investor, I'd be very upset right now. 
Camino, next question. Yes. Uh, regarding uh, the Activision move from MS, do you think games are or will become an entry platform for the metaverse? Ted, you want to take that one or you want me to take that one? Well, I, I apologize. Somebody uh, on the panel made a statement uh, regarding that question. Maybe I'd turn it back to that person. Sure, go ahead, whoever that was. Yeah, I think uh, that was me who just made the comment that um, from what I've been reading, the it seems like the, the consensus is that the industry that is best positioned to really be the entrance into the metaverse is the video game industry because they have already, in the pursuit of video games, created the most advanced version of what you could call a virtual reality world. Um, for example, you know, games like World of Warcraft, games like Fortnite, games like Second Life. Um, really are their own virtual world. They definitely have not fully integrated with the real world in terms of e-commerce and maybe social networking as much as they could. But honestly, that was probably simply because it wasn't what they were pursuing, not because they didn't have the capability. Right. I agree. Camino. Okay. Another one. What happened to Clubhouse? What can we learn from this enterprise with regards to this class? What's the name again, Camino? Clubhouse. Well, I'm not going to answer that question because I don't know Clubhouse. Logan? Uh, well, I'll field that to the panelists, but I guess I will say this goes gets back to exclusivity uh, as an economic concept. And Clubhouse, you had to have invitation, an invitation to join. And uh, there was this tremendous growth in that. Uh, and there was um, this, this idea, this aura around that it would be exclusive. And then that waned really quickly and kind of became uh, almost commoditized like another podcast. But does it, did any of the panelists want to comment? Because they may have been users of Clubhouse. Okay, we have another question about biotechnology. Does biotech stand for promising deep technology? Uh, because you know, many uh, other deep tech webinars, no one is actually talking about biotech. And so uh, the attendee wants to know, what do you think about biotech in regards to technology? Well, I, I'll just re refer to one of the contributors to the class, Neil Shen from Sequoia, and uh, he, for the last five or six years, it's been spending at least half of his time trying to understand the implications of AI. And one of the areas that AI is really going to hit and is hitting, of course, is biotech. So um, I would I would look at that through that lens of AI innovation. Um, it's not a vertical that we study in the class, um, which is sometimes a you know, there's a suggestion embodied in the in these questions, but um, I, I think I think the the question is is a really good one, and I think it is a, an area of great progress. Camino, keep going. With companies like Mercedes-Benz, uh, who plan to go all electric by 2030, do you all believe that will impact Tesla's overall market cap and uh, future revenue? Yes. Yeah, I do. I think that. When you look at the total available market, Tesla's going to have to come up with um, some other way of making money. And, and Logan sort of charted the, the path for Tesla. I mean, within, within electronic vehicles, there's a lot of upside. And I went through that with Sackett. Um, but Tesla's price point doesn't get you at all of that market. And there's going to be competition. So I think that's a, it's a very good observation and a company like Mercedes-Benz, and I think that uh, if, I, if I recall, BMW's made a similar commitment, obviously Ford and, and um, is it BD? I, I, I can't remember all the, all the companies in China, but they're, you know, Tesla's not, not gonna be without a lot of competition. Okay, would you agree that the hype capitalization, especially among the retail investors, is becoming a valid stocks performance indicator? What if one of the reasons Meta suffered such a drop is because there is no real hype among retail investors regarding Metaverse? I don't think so. I don't think that's what's going on myself, but I think it's the core, the core set of um, you know, problems that, that Meta has reported with their user base more than anything else. Logan, what do you think? 
Well, I think uh, stepping back from just looking at meta, if you look at the broader retail space, you look at institutional space, what we've seen is we've seen a bifurcation in capital on the private side. We've seen these institutional investors, such as the Fidelity, the Wellingtons of the world, they've moved down into the private space. They've funded these rounds pre-IPO. And so we've seen these large valuation shifts of essentially public money coming into private space. We've seen more risk appetite through the Robin Hoods of the world, bringing in more retail investors. And so the dynamics of who is investing in what and at what scale with what dollars in what stage of the company's life cycle is in flux right now. And I think that is part of the conversation, but in, in terms of just meta, I would isolate that and agree with Ted. I don't think that that's a major factor with retail. So, so let me uh, suggest now, now time for closing comments. And, and Clara, I, I, I wanted to get you, you to sort of comment on, on whether this class today sort of matches your experience in the class. And I, I'd be interested in just your overall reaction to the approach that we take in the class. You know, notice that we didn't have PowerPoints that laid out a particular story. Uh, we brought in some current events. We, we had a lot of dialogue, but uh, Claire, I mean, what, what's your sense of how this class is fit into your own personal and professional development and, and the approach? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I think that this uh, today's uh, webinar is really uh, quite uh, exact replicate of how the class usually is. And just as you can see, like today, I think Ted has said like maybe four times that we need to like get going. We could discuss this even further and people are raising their hands. And that is pretty typical for this class. And uh, the topics are, you don't really have a straight answer so you can discuss them. They are pretty, developing and you don't really, there's no clear cut like historical, we can look back at it and say, yeah, this is gonna be exactly like this. So I think the discussions are always really interesting and we usually mix with students, old experiences with together with the teacher and the guest speaker ones. So it's a great way to really get a lot of different uh, perspectives. And also like the discussions are really free, as you said, no PowerPoint. And you don't, aren't, you don't really get shamed when you say something. It feels like everyone is supporting each other, which is really good. Because I know that American, I am from Europe, uh, from Scandinavia, and we are a bit more shy at speaking in class overall. And I think that that is like the most important thing in this class is that it's very easy to talk out and everyone is really supporting. Yeah, I think, I think, thanks, Clara. I mean, I, you warm my heart on that one. I, I, I think that it's important for us in this kind of you know, moment to, to come up with a place and an approach where we can trust each other, but also not be too worried about the, the particular comment that we're making and allow the, the, the learning process to, to go forward and to be critical thinkers and know that we're, we're, we need to come up with a point of view. We need to come up with a narrative, uh, uh, a hypothesis, but we also realize that it's subject to change. And that's, that, that is super important. The other thing that I would just comment from my perspective, I think of this class and uh, I, when I talk to Stacy and Logan about it, I do think of it as, as a learning system. I know, Christian, you've said this is like a platform. And, and I, I, think, I think that approach, when you're dealing with a big topic, if you expect one professor to be able to deliver all of the insights, forget about it, at least not this professor, there's too much going on. So to be able to draw on insights from a lot of people. Of course, Logan's you know, contributing heavily every, every class, but we have individual members of the class who really know a lot. And then we have these speakers and there's, it's just, it's been a, a great uh, privilege for me to be part of this learning system. Just in terms of full disclosure, uh, I don't think that this class is representative of all the classes at SOM. But I do think there are two common elements. One is um, trust. You know, the, the classroom is an environment where, where you can really push yourself and not worry about uh, making a mistake. And then I think the, the quality of the faculty and, and the contributors 
um, is really, really high. So for those of you who are thinking about joining, you know, I, I think you're, you're hopefully in the right place and today has helped you understand what happens at, at Yale School of Management. Camino, are we out of time? We are, we are on time. So thank you so much to everyone, all the panelists, all the attendees for your time today. Again, the recording will be shared and uh, this was a fantastic masterclass. I myself learned a lot. So thank you very much to everyone and uh, enjoy the rest of your day, night, evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.